Hello, Derek. Uh, you are leading for the today's session, right? Hi, uh, Sohan. Uh, yes, I guess I'm presenting this week's material. Okay. Uh, we should just wait. <laughs> Hi, all. Good afternoon, all. I think we'll just wait one more minute. I saw Russ um, trying to get in via his phone. Welcome, J. Rod. Uh, welcome, Russ. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, Russ. Yes, we can see you. you. Okay. Cool. Um, great. Um, so, um, have you? I don't know whether an introduction's been done yet. Um, the this week we're doing the second half of chapter nine from our book probabilistic um machine learning uh derek solberg has kindly taken us through the slides for for this part of the chapter um for those watching on 
YouTube at a later date. Uh, this is part of a, a book club for the data science learning community. Um, and yeah, feel free to find us on the internet and, and join our Slack channel. And, and we've got plenty of book clubs of this nature to um, uh, fill your needs for learning uh, as, you, as you progress. Um, Derek, can I hand it over to you? Um, are you ready? Uh, yes, thank you, Russ, for um, leading the book club and leading the introduction there. As okay. mentioned, we will look at more elements of Chapter 9 in the Kevin Murphy textbook, Probable Disagreeing Learning. In particular today, we're going to be exploring naive Bayes classification and discuss Fisher's linear discriminant analysis. Just some bookkeeping. I will have these slides available in our resources soon. The GitHub push is not complete yet. And me personally, I am more familiar with the R programming language than Python. So you're going to see that today, partly because I was not sure of our abilities in Python in these book clubs and if we had Quartal available to us at the moment. If you look at the right side of the screen, uh, starting with naive base example, you could get a sense of what I have in store for us. I want to do kind of a simple, uh, concrete example of the naive base class classifier and kind of work our way back out from there into the more theoretical materials. As Russ mentioned last time, we could look at the ubiquitous Palmer penguins data, and that's why I'm going to do so here. The penguins data, as most people are probably familiar with, comes with this uh, categorical variable for the species, a DOE change draft and get to penguins, and that will lend itself to a classification problem. For this particular example, this comes from chapter 14 of the Bayes Rules textbook uh, written by Alicia Johnson, Miles Ott, and Mine Doguku. Some of the variables we'll be looking at, X1 is a categorical variable, simply describing a penguin that's either above average or below average in weight. X2 and X3 will be the numerical variables as indicated by that image for the build length and the build depth. Or oh, sorry, X3 is the footprint length. Compared to uh, studies you've probably done previously with logistic regression, part of our motivation is that we have three categories, that is more than two, whereas logistic regression at first is a binary classifier for, for two categories. So for the next few minutes, we're going to look at naive based classification as an alternative. Classifying two more categories does not require much mathematics beyond Bayes' rule, which we'll see here, and is computationally efficient for reasons that we'll get into. Compared to other so-called Bayesian methods, this one does not require Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. And of course, the elephant in the room, we will address why it's called naive. Suppose that an Antarctic researcher comes across a penguin that weighs less than uh, 4,200 um, grams uh, with a 195 long footprint length and a 50 millimeter long bill. Our goal is to classify that species. So for starters, uh, looking at the data for which species is a below weight most likely, Focus on the purple regions I have there in the image. Just think to yourself, if the penguin is below average in weight, which, which species is most likely? So we call Bayes' rule, um, multiplying the prior times likelihood, and if need be, divide by the normalizing constant. The Background theory goes through, in this case, the three classes, a DOE, chinstrap, strap, and get into penguins. We could run some calculations, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to scroll through this fairly quickly. 
we have some prior probabilities from the data that the Antarctic scientists got. The likelihood from the bar chart that we have the below average weight for the penguins, calculating that normalizing constant, the total probability. And then finally, running through Bayes' rule to calculate the posterior distribution. Looking at the numbers on the right-hand side of this set of calculations, we have the posterior distribution for this scenario. And at this moment, we simply ask ourselves, which one of those three numbers is the, the largest? By the way, the calculations unfolded, our posterior probability is pointing towards the ideal species of the penguins. Moving right along, but feel free to ask questions. I, I do have the chat window open as well. So if you prefer that method, that's there. Looking at a numerical predictor, a 15 millimeter long bill, I have the density plots of the three species in front of us. The vertical line corresponds to the 15 millimeter observation. And we are just asking ourselves, in this scenario, which one of the species is the most likely? So go ahead and visualize that for yourself. Going through the calculations. And before I forget, in fact, I is curious about the R code. I tried to include it as often as I could. Some considerations, uh, once we get into the continuous variables, it's com it might be difficult to compute likelihood, at least based on the underlying mathematical framework. This is one area where the naive part of the naive Bayes classifications comes in. We assume that each numerical variable is continuous and conditionally normal. So they each have a normal distribution with an associated mean and variance. The density plots, et cetera, were found using the sample statistics from the three species. And un underlying what the naive Bayes classification will do now with the normal distributions is this image here. Once again, the vertical dashed line is our observation of a 50 millimeter build length. And we are asking which one of those species is the most likely, which one of them has the highest probability. Running through the calculations, gonna scroll through this. Once again, focus on the paragraph of calculations that is at the end of the Bayes rule crank. We have the posterior distribution for the 50 millimeter uh, build length. And this time around, looking at for the highest probability, we see that this calculation is pointing us towards the chin strap penguins. Oh, sorry, the Gentoo penguins. So, Oddly enough, in my first two examples here, one classified the penguin as a DOA, one classified the penguin as Gentoo. Of course, in a problem penguins data, there are more variables, so we can incorporate more variables. Moving right along, let's say we're looking at two numerical predictive variables. The dashed lines correspond to a 50 millimeter long bill and a 195 millimeter long flipper. In the two-dimensional scatter plot, try to get a sense of which species we're pointing at this time. Running through the Bayes rule, another aspect that comes up, especially in this whole chapter in general, is the notion that we are making the assumption that the variables are conditionally independent from each other. Mm -hmm. 
that the that the in this case the build lengths and the flipper lengths are actually independent of each other because we are on top of that trying to classify the species. This deeper understanding will come up uh, quite a bit in our studies in this textbook, I, I feel. This notion of conditional independence will help us with mathematically efficient calculations. All these calculations that I'm presenting today can be done in milliseconds or nanoseconds. The issue is that we are heavily ignoring covariance and correlation. Running through the calculations again, prior dis prior distributions, likelihoods, running through the normalizing constant total probability and Bayes rule. With the two numerical predictors, looking at the numbers on the bottom right, we want one more time, look at this posterior distribution, look for the classification that received the highest probability. And we could state that in our scenario, we most, certainly have a chin strap penguin. I ran through this example fairly quickly. Does anybody have any questions at the moment? For people that want to dive in, again, I'm biased towards the R programming language. So for now, I will present the ARB code. Of If you want to use a naive Bayes classifier, it comes from a, a, a relatively old package in the R universe, the E1071 package, which I believe was compiled by professors and students in Austria. They have many useful statistics functions that are still useful to this day. From there, after running the naive Bayes function on the models, you could use the usual predict function. The nice thing is in the predict function, if you use it as usual, it'll give you the classification label. But if you type in this parameter type equals raw, it'll all it'll give you the posterior distribution in full. Like the above examples, once we got to the model with the two numerical variables, the posterior distribution is definitely pointing us towards the chin strap penguins. Thinking about the machine learning side of things, when we have the categorical variable to predict, we end up with confusion matrices. And what we're hoping for is that, of course, our prediction or identifying a DOE penguins when the penguin is a DOE, chin strap penguins when the penguin is chin strap, and so forth. Moreover, we're hoping for the largest counts to be on the main diagonal. My first model only had an accuracy of 76%, and we can see a bunch of misclassifications. My second model, fortunately, has an accuracy of 95%. Worrying about overfitting, we could also do cross-validation. This particular function is a helper function from the Bayes rules textbook code package. So if you want to do Cross validation on naive Bayes. There's a great tool out there that will do this for you. Of course, this is a more computationally intensive process. So this particular line of code might take your computer about four minutes. After cross validation, it will average the results into one more confusion matrix, where one more time we are seeking the correct classifications on the main diagonal. All right, so once again, most of the material I presented so far came from the Bayes rules textbook because I wanted uh, the concrete example. And of course I had it available to me. We'll now move back to the 
Kevin Murphy textbook, probabilistic machine learning, and talk about some of the more theoretical mathematical elements. Over the decades, statisticians uh, deeply studied these linear discriminant analyses that we're talking about in this chapter. And in particular, for the naive base classifier, the maximum likelihood estimates. When we have binary features, ones and zeros, the MLE is pointing simply at the proportions of true values over the total counts. That sounds great. For discrete features, categorical variables, the MLE is pointing towards the number of observations in that category divided by the number of observations in general. And for numerical features, the formulas you see at the bottom of the screen, the MLEs are pointing at the population mean and the population variance. That is to say, the statisticians felt kind of a, a consistency between all the formulas and the theory that they wanted for, for their frequentist perspective. However, as mentioned back, I believe, in chapter two of the textbook, when we move from training data to test data, some there might be some edge cases where the calculations don't completely work out, especially when we are working with data that have maybe a lot of rare results or low counts. So the theory furthermore suggests maximum a posteriority estimates. And um, this is called add one smoothing, where we have a different type of estimate for the, or an updated estimate for the naive base classifier. The textbook quickly explains that this is still pretty good for our purposes. The formulas for the naive base classifiers are still pretty straightforward. At this moment, I think I'll flip the tab over to the workbook that the textbook author provides for the naive base classifier. I wanted to mention earlier that, of course, most people that want to get into this would pr probably prefer to load up Sidekick Learn in Python. And there, of course, is a naive base classification tool in there. The textbook example, what it does is is classifies the the digits MINST data and through the 10 classes and the data matching the correct labels at the top of the image with the sample images in purple and yellow, the naive base classifier seems to do a pretty good job. The textbook author instead Instead of using Psychic Learn, actually coded this Python notebook and CodeLab session directly using the underlying theory, the maximum likelihood estimates I mentioned earlier, along with the add one smoothing for the maximum a posteriori estimates. In case anybody's following along with the textbook, I fully admit I'm going slightly out of order into an order that I thought just made more sense to me. The textbook author mentioned that if you have missing values in your input variables, in your features, uh, here are some considerations. If we're missing a, a, a value called xj, overall for Gaussian discriminant analysis, we can still compute the likelihoods by simply using the likelihoods coming from the other observations in that feature. For the naive base classifier, mathematically, this is actually even less complex because we don't have to worry about the, the priors and the likelihoods as much. We could just jump straight towards the posterior distribution and compute the information once again from the data we have available to us. <clears throat> like you all discussed last week with uh, some connections between the various tools that we have 
available to us. We have some connections with the Bayes classifier and logistical regression. If you go through the textbook of proofs of the naive Bayes classification, you can rewrite it in these exponential forms, which remind us of the multinomial logistic regression in that formula that we have on the top of the screen, where the betas and the gammas would still have to be tuned. Thinking about just some more subtle differences between naive Bayes and logistic regression, naive Bayes, once again, is conditionally independent, and that makes our lives easy because it's computationally efficient. It generalizes to two or more categories, so it applies to real-world data sets pretty nicely. On the other hand, assuming a lot of independence along the way uh, violates a lot of assumptions early on in your modeling and your pre-processing. And on the mathematical, theoretical mathematical side, naive Bayes optimizes the joint likelihood because it can, because of the conditionally independent assumption. Logistic regression at first recall is a binary classification, only deals with two categories. The nice thing is though, when you get the coefficients, there are the logarithms of the rate of change. So you could um, quickly describe to your teammates, to your clients, what those relationships are between the variables, whereas other tools such as naive Bayes are not as interpretable. Because of the underlying comp uh, calculations are a little more complicated, it optimizes the conditional likelihood. So with all that said, suppose that maybe we don't want to only rely on naive Bayes. It, we violated a lot of assumptions. All of our wishes for independence, conditional independence between the variables might not be founded. So why don't we step back a bit and consider what happens if we do allow ourselves to worry about those covariance matrices once again, like you did last week. Uh, we could try out discriminant analyses, and we're thinking more towards generative approaches for relatively ease of mathematics. Uh, we're going to fit multivariate Gaussians. Now, when we're thinking about big covariance matrices and any algorithms that deal with matrices, you realize in the big O notation, uh, big O, N squared, and all that stuff, it might become computationally prohibitive pretty quickly, especially for your large data sets. Thus, people quickly wanted dimensionality reduction. All these ideas combine into Fisher's linear discriminant analysis. Um, here in our notes, we're going to give this the acronym FLDA to make this a little bit more clear because elsewhere in literature, you also have the they tend Dirichlet allocation, LDA, that might be confusing in our acronyms. So FLDA for linear discriminant analysis. But alas, something to consider right away is that the underlying mathematics restricts you to C minus one dimensions, where C is the number of classes available in your data, whereas even if you do a lot of work by allowing yourselves multiple variables, even in a reduced dimension space, you're still restricted to what the data is available for you in the classification problem. So that might be restrictive, but of course we'll go over more complex tools later in this book club. I, uh, just for the sake of my sanity, really did not copy all the mathematical proofs from the Murphy textbook to our slides, but just to give an overview for some of the mathematical ideas that continue along in Fisher's linear discriminant analysis, we have some constructions called scatter matrices. This is 
um, based on our scenarios where we're taking the data, we're projecting it onto a lower dimensional space. So these scatter matrices are made along the way and they are estimating covariance matrices. We of course would also have in the linear algebra, the projection matrix down uh, because of this restriction up here, down from uh, D to K dimensions. When the proof comes together at the end, and it's the one problem at the end of the chapter for homework, if you're so inclined, our objective is to maximize this ratio of determinants uh, based on the projection matrix down to the k-dimensional space. The reason why the mathematicians are interested in this angle is because now looking at our scenarios instead of uh, covariance matrices directly where we have again the big O and squared algorithms, we have an eigenvalue eigenvector scenario where we do have algorithms for estimating eigenvalues eigenvectors, which may be faster computationally than big O and squared. So this will help us in the long run, especially for larger data sets. Whew. I've said a lot of, and admittedly skipped a lot as well. I just want to take a pause here for the folks in the audience. Does anybody have any questions or how, how are we feeling? You know, I, f I find it funny that the, the number of classes should determine the dimensionality of, that you can use in this model. Because, I mean, if I, if I have a two-class problem, I, then I could draw out in the plane um, two dimensions that would be linearly separable. It, it, I don't know. It, it feels odd to me, but I'm sure there's completely valid reasons for it. Yes, like elsewhere we see in mathematics, sometimes it's just the notion of like necessary and sufficient conditions. If we want to adhere to the theorems, then we yes, we are stuck to the C minus one dimensions restriction. Of course, you yourself might be able to program um, more decision boundaries uh, depending on the algorithm you, you choose to use. In the discussion of dimensionality reduction, people in this audience were probably thinking, well, isn't that where principal component analysis comes in? So let's, let's spend a couple moments thinking about that. I'm going to simplify for my example, the example uh, and look at these two species of penguins, Shinstrap and Gentoo, and just thinking broadly, how would we classify this based on these two numerical predictors? Now, recall what PCA does, and before I forget, if you want the R code, once again, I do have it provided here. You know, it's kind of fun for me to figure this out real quick. Recall what PCA does is it looks at all the data available in our sample and it wants to find a direction in that encapsulates all the as much variance as possible, as much variance as possible. With that in mind, I specifically chose to use just one color for the scatter plot in this particular image. If we then take the data that was labeled chinstrap and gentoo penguins and project it onto that orange line, we would get this density plot here, where we get a sense of maybe it's easy to classify the penguins, maybe it's not. Namely, that there is some overlap in, in the categories. 
So then part of the motivation for Fisher's linear discriminant analysis is that we do have labels on the data. So instead of just treating the data set as an overall whole, we can incorporate the class labels, in this case, Chinstrap and Gentoo, and that will play a role in where we put the boundary. So oddly enough, compared to PCA or perhaps support vector machines, this boundary might seem kind of weird to us. However, when we now project the purple and green dots onto the decision boundary, or the, I, I think I ended up calling these discriminant uh, linear discriminants, we have arguably more separation between the classes and thus will later get more accuracy in our classifications. To say that over again, let me put all four images on the same screen. With principal component analysis in the top left, it will look at the variance from the entire data set, but that might not be completely helpful for us for the sake of making classification tasks. On the top right, Fisher's linear discriminant analysis will take the labels of the classes into account as part of the calculation and will arguably lead to situations where the classes are better separated and help us with our classification task. Now, admittedly, with my penguins data, I chose real world data that does have still, that still has some overlap. The textbook uh, through a similar thought process, the textbook author looked at some men and women data in some data set. And long story short, in the bottom right, you could kind of see what uh, we were going for with the separation of the classes. So now, Quoting the textbook, we have some discriminative algorithms for classification tasks, and we have generative algorithms for classification tasks. Most of the ones that probably uh, those of us in the book club have studied are of the discriminative variety. They're probably a bit more classical, a bit more um, well studied and mathematically sound and, and whatnot. However, what I'm thinking of as of the time of this recording is that we're moving into an exciting age of artificial intelligence and we are familiar with generative AI. So we want to be able to have gener generative classifiers to be a useful tool for us. With that said, let's just quickly think about some advantages of each. For the discriminative classifiers, uh, so far in the literature, they have better predictive accuracy. So that might be pretty key in your research. They can handle feature pre-processing. Say if you need to do transformations of variables, outlier uh, removals, and so forth. If you're going to be doing a lot of pre-processing, that's probably going to let itself to discriminative classifiers instead of trying to generate new data uh, based on data you have already manipulated. With the discriminative classifiers, we also have well-calibrated probabilities in that we have established data rather than novel data. The generative classifiers are exciting because they are easier to fit. We have, like we saw above with the naive base classifiers, we have methods in place that uh, run really quickly on our computers. We could handle missing input features. So if your collectors, the people making your data set and tabulating your observations. If they cannot get data or 
there are certain times where you cannot get all the data. Fortunately, the imputation processes are backed up by the underlying mathematics. Thanks to the conditional independence assumption, we could fit the classes separately. Basically, we're making the density plots for each class separately. And if we need to bring in a new class, a new region of data, so to speak, we don't have to remake the previous density plots. That could save you time as well. And I mentioned this already in that sense, we could handle un unlabeled training data. Or if you're going from your training data to your test data, and your test data has a completely new label, uh, Bayesian methods especially are, are great for this. And if the data is also spurious in the numerical aspects, the generative classifiers might be able to handle that better as well. With all that said, as we were going through the textbook, uh, reading through the mathematical formulas and the pros and cons of discriminative and generative classifiers, I, I don't know about you, but I just kept sitting there thinking, well, what are discriminative and generative classifiers in addition to the mathematical formulas? So one thing I wanted to leave us with is, at least according to one blog post, here are the algorithms. And with that said, that brings me to the end of the materials I brought today. And we'll just um, talk more about the materials now. And if you have any questions, please ask.